Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Madhura Purna Pragna from PES University, Bangalore, and I'm happy to present our work titled TimeNet Hardware Accelerator for Ternary Convolutional Neural Networks. So, before I actually dive into the topic, uh, I would like to highlight and dive into the individual keywords in this title. So, maybe let's get started with the term hardware accelerator. Hardware accelerator is the key in this work. To understand what is a hardware accelerator, maybe let's look into a little bit of computing history. So this is a, a very a well known plot in the computing world, the Moore's law. So what you see here is actually a depiction of time versus the number of transistors that have uh, grown over the over over the past 20 30 years right so if if you look at uh, the number of transistors on the y axis and the time from 1970s onwards to about a couple of years ago the number of transistors as the moore's law states has grown has doubled approximately every two years and that has reflected in the improvement in performance performance in the sense that you um, researchers were able to build better processors single core processors with when they started off with single core processors early in the 1970s moving on to today where we have you know really complex multi-core processors we have uh, graphic processors multi-core many core processors etc etc so the density of transistors that can be packed on a single chip has really grown over time. So this should actually reflect in how good you can run your application on to this kind of processors. But now let's look at another plot here, which actually shows it's the same Moore's law where I still have the same dots in terms of transistor counts and how that has grown over time and how that has been you know exploited by the computing industry uh, by building better processors so we started with mips early on we moved on to pentium then a four core opteron a 48 core prototype of uh, intel many core processors so on and so forth gpus also came along in the same path where transistors the simply the capability of packing many 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 transistors facilitated this growth but if you look at it in terms of performance the blue line here what you will notice is somewhere it began began to stall it began to flatten so even though there were more transistors that were being continuously packed processing performance which should have actually gone along the orange line of parallel processing performance showed a flattening in the curve so you did not see processor performance grow along the lines of transistor densities frequency also had to stall because of uh, limits in physics power also had to stall because the amount of power a single chip could take is limited number of cores did grow but it did not reflect in parallel processing performance so what does that really mean if i look at it the number of transistors are enough to you know get the chip melting but i am not able to get the same kind of performance earlier on if i wanted to run an application uh, faster i would simply wait a couple of years and i would have a new chip from intel or amd or nvidia and things would get faster by itself right it would grow it grew linearly with time but that is not happening anymore so there is a fundamental shift in the way we look at performance and the relative transistor count so there is a paradigm shift that is actually needed now so if i look at uh, maybe an application this is a plot again to see the core count and energy efficiency uh, this is a particular case about uh, signal processing applications. Uh, 
and the energy problem itself. So if you have, if you look at energy efficiency, which is, you know, how many operations can you perform in a single milliwatt? And if I plot the performance for a application domain, in terms of um, mapping it onto CPUs, there is a limit of how far I can get in terms of efficiency. Maybe adding in GPUs could get it a little further and adding digital signal processors could get it slightly higher. But what is actually making a shift is adding what are called as dedicated hardware accelerators that gives you a jump, a 100x jump. Right, a 100x jump, which could not be achieved by any general purpose processor. So we are talking about building dedicated processors, dedicated hardware accelerators, dedicated custom hardware that could solve the energy efficiency problem. So looking at hardware accelerators is inevitable. And that is the way the computing world is moving towards. Right, so that is the first term in my uh, title that I wanted to go over, which is how did we develop hardware accelerators towards building convolutional or exploiting applications in the deep learning environment, which is particularly the convolutional neural network. What is exactly these dedicated custom processors? What are these? So I want to, in, and I, I want to highlight that we are talking about moving towards custom hardware. This is custom hardware, which is you know fine-tuned for a particular application, which means we are drifting away. Well, that's what is happening around. So Intel recently talked about acquisition of uh, Altera. There was Xilinx that's buying, uh, being bought over by AMD. And then there is Google TPU, which is an alternative to NVIDIA's GPU and many in these lines, right? So all these traditional computing environments or traditional computing processing companies are moving towards hardware acceleration. So hardware acceleration is the next thing to look towards. And what do we really mean by hardware acceleration? And what is it that's different between existing processors and this custom hardware? So existing processors, you know, go through the standard uh, processing paradigm of one moment computing, where you, you know, start with um, a closely coupled memory. You fetch instructions which are stored there. You decode. You, you know, get data from registers, feed it to the ALU, move it to the data memory or registers, and you go on doing this sequentially. This is the sequential or temporal computing paradigm where you run things over and over in time and temporally. So the same set of resources are used over and over again in time. And this is entirely sequential. So no matter what application you run, you use the same computing paradigm of a processor. Moving towards hardware acceleration is what has become very commercially viable is the use of what are called as field programmable gate arrays, which are a sea of functional units. So what you see here as tiny blocks are flip-flops and functional units, where functional units can be configured. So this is just a depiction of a truth table. So as long as you can define a function in terms of a truth table, you can put it into, or you can define your own custom functional unit. And you can have a sea of those. So you have very many functional units. In fact, you can think of the same processors ALU, the same processors ALU being spread out over the area of the entire device. So you have customizable functional units laid out on the device. And this functionality can be according to what is the application that you decide to map onto this particular device. So FPGAs are very, very viable, uh, are commercially available devices that have been used, are being used as target devices for custom hardware acceleration. As you can see, processors have limited parallelism. There is only so much that can be done with a single ALU, or maybe there are 
a few ALUs, right? A handful of ALUs, but then the temporal computing paradigm still uses a single ALU which has limited parallelism. And the micro architecture of the processor is very fixed. It's a fixed architecture with very limited scalability. And as we saw early on, the performance did not scale by putting in multiple processors as well. Whereas FPGAs or hardware accelerator, the device for hardware acceleration provides user-defined parallelism. So you have the entire space of the device that can be used spatially to map applications that can be run in parallel. There is enormous amount of flexibility and this leads to better performance per watt as compared to the traditional temporal computing paradigm versus what is available here spatially to implement any custom device, any custom application, any dedicated hardware or any hardware accelerator. So what is it that's unique about FPGAs? FPGAs are different. They have a different internal architecture. The application mapping flow in a processor would you know, typically take a few minutes, but what happens on an FPGA is actual hardware design, which could actually take a few hours. And we are often bogged up with you know, the compilation time that actually you know, uh, we see for FPGAs. Hear this all the time in the lab you you see that compilation has been running for a week right depending on the complexity of the application itself so going inside the fpga fabric let's take a look at what really is an fpga and what is it that facilitate hardware acceleration so fpgas can be thought of as two-dimensional grid of configurable logic blocks so what you see as tiles here are configurable logic blocks and that is what uh, we saw in the previous um, slide that these are tiny functional units that can be customized. In addition, there are also certain dedicated columns of memory and special function units called DSP slices or DSP blocks. Now, this is your fabric, which can be used, which is entirely user configurable. So you can actually map whatever application you want onto it. So for example, I use a bunch of resources to build a crypto processor. I put alongside an image processing engine. I also put an ethernet controller, for example. Right, and it also has this unique feature of runtime reconfigurability where I can actually you know, change the functionality over time. Uh, I had something like this yesterday and today I can you know, modify it in field to have a graphic processor, I have a gaming engine, and maybe even a MIPS processor. This is the spatial computing and the flexible hardware that is available off the shelf from leading vendors like Xilinx and Altera and many more, which has shown promising results for custom building custom hardware devices. Right. So with this in mind, I just want to spend a couple of minutes into looking at what is it that makes it so flexible. So this is how an FPGA actually looks. It's made up of programmable logic, programmable routing, and programmable IO. So you have these blue boxes, which are logic functions, which can implement any logic function. And then you have these black boxes that connect these logic functions. And there are these programmable IO blocks in the peripheral that permit getting data in and out to these internal logic structures. If I go in deeper, I have these logic blocks, which are nothing but lookup tables connected to flip-flops. Now, lookup tables internally are nothing but SRAMs, which let me add any functionality or the truth table. I can configure the SRAM with any functional truth table that permits me to use it as my application or application level functionality right so i this is the level of uh, configurability user configurability that is permitted in this kind of a programmable logic structure so we would like to we what we have done in this work is we have leveraged fpgas as hardware accelerator particularly to suit the application we have customized uh, um, the FPGA in terms of 
using custom bit width operations, we have introduced custom operators, and the enormous amount of parallel functional units have been exploited to facilitate parallel execution, have parallel instances that have resulted in hardware acceleration. So that is all about taking an application, which is the convolution neural network in our case, and putting it onto the FPGA device and configuring it so that this device behaves according to the functionality that we want. It achieves hardware acceleration on account of the customizability and the enormous amount of parallelism. So that was all about hardware acceleration. Hardware, hardware acceleration has been introduced for a particular application in TileNet, which is the convolutional neural networks. Now let's move on to this um, topic. Convolution neural networks have become, you know, very popular in many, many domains, uh, um, very popular in image classification, popular in object detection in driverless cars. They're also popular in medical imaging for things like uh, image classification in healthcare, face recognition, and, you know, the current scenario has led to many, many applications. So convolution net neural networks are used widely. And our focus this uh, work was to look at convolution neural networks, particularly for driver assistance systems. Driver assistance systems are where you know you have these tiny devices running on the automobile mo where you want to capture images and at real time make this classification or object identification and detection. So we want this implementation or you we want this application for the hardware accelerator that has been developed for convolutional neural networks to be affordable have high performance and also have you know power considerations because this is meant to run on a mobile or a platform that is not connected to continuous power supply all the time right so this has this can lead to many other applications as well it can, uh, it's a very, you know, uh, widely used uh, application with uh, focus on, you know, IoT devices, maybe, or even, you know, body area network, many, many things where, you know, you are talking about uh, real time inference. So convolution neural networks, um, the, the, the core of it is uh, a CNN model, a convolution neural network model that is trained in this context we are talking about images so we train it with a bunch of images and we observe the output and if there is an error we, uh, we we compare the output with the ground truth and if there is an error we go back and uh, modify the model in terms of the weights that are uh, available the weights that are actually trained right so this is a continuous process training is the starting point you train a cnn model for a bunch of images so that it can infer infer well with high accuracy during runtime so training is typically done on you know let's say if we take an example of uh, uh, image a data set like imagenet and a model model like alexnet it's typically done on really huge computing facilities which are you know uh, meant to be in dedicated computing uh, environments like a supercomputing environment uses you know, processors uh, like graphic processors very many graphic processors um, also you know google's uh, tensor processing unit was dedicated or is dedicated for neural network uh, training so this training is very 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 compute intensive could run really long and runs on exclusive super supercomputing environment but once this is done, what you would like to use or what is our application scenario is to use this model with the train set of weights and give it images that can be inferred or identified as a particular object during real time. And this is our context, right? This is the context of where we would like to use convolution neural networks. And this is typically done on tiny devices such as DSPs, you know, tiny processors, uh, embedded processors. And of course, in this context, we are looking primarily at custom hardware acceleration through the use of FPGAs. 
So what is our starting point is to look at the convolutional layer, which is the most compute intensive portion of the convolutional neural network, which takes images, a bunch of images and a bunch of weights, and it convolves to produce an output. So this portion of convolution is what TileNet does. So TileNet looks primarily at accelerating the convolutional neural network, and the focus is the convolution layer itself. So TileNet is a hardware accelerator for convolution neural networks. So that gets me done with two por portion, two keywords of the uh, title itself. And there is one key aspect to it, which is the turnerization. So turnerization in this context is about looking at the weights, particularly the weights, which are stored, typically stored on chip, and we are looking at quantizing this weights. So quantization is looking at the precision of weights. So typically weights are nothing but numbers which are represented using fixed flow point, floating point numbers. And we look at cutting it down or quantizing it or approximating it so that it can result in more efficient hardware, less space. It can you know, bring about acceleration. And in this particular hardware accelerator, we are turnerizing them. Turnerization in this context is about representing any value with just three values, which is a zero, a plus one, and a minus one. So any 32-bit value, any floating point number is now approximated as a zero or a plus one or a minus one. So there are methods of turnerization where you know you look at only positive values are replaced by one plus one all negative values are replaced by minus one and everything around the range of zero becomes a zero right as one would imagine there are there are consequences to it consequences to it but there are many many benefits to it as well so that is what happens so when you Turnerize the weights, there are some consequences. So, what the first and foremost is you can no longer use the operators that are av available on your device. So, you can no longer use those floating point multipliers, adders, etc., that are available in your device. It's, it's, you can use them, but then they are kind of you're underutilizing the power of these operators. So, you need custom operators. And the floating point 32 bit flix, uh, float or fixed point operators are no longer viable or no longer efficient. And a very major impact is in terms of accuracy. Now, if you, you know, approximate a number which was of a 32 bit value into something that is a plus one, minus one, and a zero, it's very normal or very expected that there will be a loss in accuracy. And accuracy is a major concern in convolutional neural networks where it could affect the way you infer an object. You're looking at images and if there is an error, there is a very, a very high chance that you infer a wrong image, which is unacceptable. However, our studies, which can be looked up in the paper, have shown that turnerization of just weights result in acceptable errors. There are very few, uh, there is less than 1% of error uh, noticeable at the uh, very end of object detection. This is also because they are all trained at full precision and only the inference, the inference during real time is done at, done with turnerized weights. Having realized that accuracy is well within control, what is the advantage of all of this is the memory footprint, right? So now whatever were numbers were represented during using 32 bits, now can be just done with two bits. Since you have three definite values, plus one, minus one, and a zero, just three bits are sufficient to represent any weight value. So that simply shrinks the memory footprint. So whatever was 
you know a multiple of 32 bits is now a multiple of three bits so that's the order a significant amount of memory reduction memory footprint reduction and the reduction in memory footprint also translates to uh, data transfer uh, overheads now you have fewer bytes to transfer you have fewer bytes to work with right? so also results in overall reduction of computation time and also in terms of uh, um, memory uh, access time. So all of this is good for time. So that was all about hardware acceleration, looking at convolutional neural networks, and finally looking at turnerization. Now with the base set, let's actually dive into the design and implementation of this hardware accelerator called Tilenet for ternary convolutional neural networks. So the primary aspect or the primary application that we started off with, with, the, with our collaborators was to look at advanced driver assistance systems. And primarily, our primary focus in this context was to look at high throughput. High throughput, you want to have very high rates of frames per second of image recognition which translates to operations per second in terms of throughput so how many operations can you perform per second and it has to be scalable now we talk about scalability in terms of adaptability to any network now uh, image recognition object detection classification is a, is a really fast moving uh, application domain where there are new models new networks that have be, are being developed continuously for um, uh, in convolutional neural network domain. So you want to have a scalable architecture, a scalable hardware accelerator that adapts to any of these uh, networks to remain viable, to remain in the state of the art. Right? You want, you do not want to develop something that becomes outdated in no time, and it has to be very generic. Right? Uh, the the implementation should meet a variety of resource target resource constraints i may design for a particular application domain but what kind of device i end up using is very very specific to where or who is using this so there may be a car which uses a certain device i may have it on some some other uh, which application um, or any other end user who may want to use a different device now, I do not want to have a hardware accelerator that is, you know, developed, you spend a lot of time and achieve high throughput, which is limited to a certain resource constraint or it's limited to a certain target device. And so these were our primary objectives, high throughput, scalability and keeping it generic. So how did we actually do that? Our first step was to develop what we call the tile. As I uh, mentioned earlier, our uh, turnerization changes everything. It changes the way we look at computations in the convolutional layer. And as it happens, the convolutional, la convolutional layer is heavy in terms of multiply accumulate operations. And the input being an 8-bit uh, input, the turnerized weight is a 2-bit input we have to develop ternary operators ternary operators and particularly ternary multipliers so that we could actually perform this kind of an operation so we have an 8-bit input and a 2-bit input which have to be multiplied to produce an 8-bit output which can be then added over accumulating them over multi mul many many instances of these multipliers the ternary multiplier itself operates on 2-bit data and 8-bit data. Now, this 2-bit data is needed to represent a 0, a 1, and a minus 1. The third of it is unused. Now, looking at this, if I have an 8-bit input and the other one is a 0, then I know that the outcome is a 0. If I have an 8-bit input and the other input is a 1, I know that the output is nothing but the 8-bit input itself. And so I have to just move this 8-bit input out to the output. 
and if the input is minus 1, multiplication in this context is just looking at the 2's complement of the input. Right, so this comes in very conveniently for a lookup table implementation. This two input lookup table simply implements the logic that is needed to either output a zero, a one, or a two's complement of the input. So these are the three inputs to the lookup table and the turnerized weight itself is the selection line for the inputs to the lookup table. So it fits in very well with lookup tables and lookup tables are what are available in abundance in FPGAs. So we have um, a bunch of multipliers which feed adders and this entire structure and in this context to, to keep in context there is a three cross three tile size that we have looked at which needs nine multipliers so we pack with the image size of three cross three, three for RGB and three uh, inputs. And uh, we have nine, which results in nine ternary multipliers followed by an adder tree. It is packed onto a single tile. Now, this is what we call a tile. The tile is the compute unit or the primary unit that performs computations in the convolution layer for the multiply accumulate operations, which are extremely expensive in terms of computation simply because there are very many of those so how do we use this structure we put it together we have very many tiles put together in the tile net structure of hardware accelerator for ternary neural networks and we have uh, some amount of on-chip memory to store uh, to store Weight, the weights and the input feature map and, and also we have some amount of resources set aside for other layers such as relu and max pool which actually do not form the compute intensive portion of the uh, cnns in addition we have an output memory which you know stores all the outputs that have been uh, estimated and then a control logic block which orchestrates data movement from the input through the on chip memory and through the tiles and over to all the layers and finally to the output memory and the tile that we discussed in the previous slide is put together we put a bunch of tiles to realize a convolution neural network a layer so the immediate question that arises is we have to kind of estimate compute and memory the question is tile is good but how many tiles do you need memory is good how much memory do you need do you implement one layer or many layers so the convolution neural network is made up of many many layers and the number of layers depends on what model you are looking at it depends on um, what is the application that you're looking at and it very it, it could be really diverse and since our objective was to develop a generic template, we had to worry about all this. So what did we do? We started with a tile, which has the compute intensive kernel. We attached some memory to it. We put it as a block and we replicated this block so that we could implement a layer. And then we could have a layer in streaming mode of operation where we have many, many layers put together you send in images you get the output you have enough computation available for each layer so that the next layer could get started so it's a streaming mode of operation or we have the systolic mode of operation where we have all the computation resources that have been used to implement um, all the computation resources have been used to implement as many tiles that could be viable and there is memory that has been used to uh, output the computations performed by the available resources. And then we run it systolic in a systolic fashion so that any model can be implemented. Our initial results uh, for a you know, bunch of models showed that um, the systolic uh, is, is slower. So what you see is the number of clock cycles needed for uh, running in these two modes of operation, be it streaming or the systolic. Uh, 
So the blue is the streaming, the red is the systolic, and we uh, you know, ran a bunch of experiments on some well-known models like AlexNet, LeNet, VGG, and our ResNet. Uh, what we notice is uh, the streaming tends to be better than the systolic mode of operation. So number of cycles, we want to reduce it. We want it to be as minimal as possible. So lower is better, and the blue one tends to be better overall. So we st stick with the streaming mode of operation and our next objective. So we have handled the generic template part of the solution. Our next objective is to make sure that it is scalable. And you want to be able to use it to smaller networks, larger networks. And how do we do it? And we want to do it at a very high level, right? You, so we built a performance estimator. The, the job of the performance estimator is to actually predict what is a performance given the set of um, user level constraints right what is the scenario in which it's going to be deployed so we have two sets of constraints in this context we have uh, device specific parameters such as you know what is the device how big is the fabric how many lookup tables how many flip-flops vrams etc and you also have um, uh, target specific constraints. So uh, that, that, that is the context, right? What is the CNN that you're looking at? Is it AlexNet? Is it LeNet? Is how many layers does it have? What is the size of the input, size of the outputs? So in a sense, how much is the computation and what is the res resulting memory that I actually need so that I can all. So I, the, the, the way we looked at it is we came up with a tile implementation. So given the resource de device specific parameters in terms of what is the target device, what is the resource, uh, the performance of each resource, we come up with an estimate for area. So what is the size of a size or area of a tile based on device specific parameters? And we also take the neural network parameters and we estimate the total number of tiles that we need for a particular model, right? So tile is our unit of, um, estimation the unit to measure area so that we can uh, estimate what is the performance for a particular model on a particular device so that way we remain scalable to any model and we remain generic to any device so based on these two inputs we uh, come to uh, to realize whether the current device is suitable whether the you know the design size that we started off with is fine so for example, if there are, um, if the model is really huge and I cannot, uh, the number of resources available are not sufficient, then I may have to use whatever is available and run it multiple times so that I can implement the entire model. Or maybe I have a model that is small enough and a single spatial uh, resource availability is sufficient to run it at one instance. So do we run it multiple times or do we run it a single time that is what is we can uh, judge at the end of resource estimation for a given network and at the end of it i know what is the throughput right so this performance estimator is uh, is key to uh, key to observing whether uh, observing and analyzing the feasibility of um, meeting throughput requirements meeting um, with specific parameters and also, so user specific constraints so given a scenario of you know a certain device and a certain model a certain application what what can i expect the throughput to be since throughput is very very much of interest right in adas uh, you want to be aware of uh, you want to be sure that throughput is your primary objective right so you can with this this estimator get an idea of what the throughput will be if throughput is not met, you either look at a different model or you look at a different device entirely and you redo this entire uh, estimation, uh, estimation flow to get until you meet your uh, throughput requirements. So we have validated this design flow and we have seen that the error that we actually got um, with validation on real hardware was you know, less than about 0.1%, which is very optimistic in uh, throughput estimation. So that meets the scalability part of our objective. Now coming to throughput, 
our implementation we looked at uh, the design and we now implemented it on a particular device we implemented vgg we implemented restnet alexnet and Lean. and gave, uh, and, and estim, uh, actually measured throughput. So this is not just estimation, we measured throughput. And what we saw is about 20 to 40 tera operations per second is what we got as throughput. So the, the y-axis here is tera operations per second. So how many operations can you perform in a single second? And you want this to be high as possible, as high as possible. So the range of uh, performance in this context is about 20 to 40 teraops. Whereas uh, one may wonder, how does this look in terms of, of what is available as state of the art? Uh, there are more details in the paper where uh, we see that existing implementations are uh, mainly in the range of about three to four, 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 14 tera operations per second. And so we are orders of magnitude better than what is available out there in terms of throughput. So throughput is the objective that has been met scalability has been met and the generic nature of the design has also been met right so the outcomes of high throughput so we are orders of magnitude better in terms of operations per second we have you know exploited many things which has result in high resulted in high throughput we have used um, turnerization we have used custom operations we have used the you know fabric of the FPGA, which is made up of lookup tables, which is spread out spatially that allows us to implement very many, many tiles in parallel, which simply accel accelerates computation. The turnerization also results in lower footprint, which is result resulted in higher operations per second, orders of magnitude better than what is available out there. It is scalable. I can extend it to any device, any model, and it is also generic, right? So it meets uh, target resource constraints. So I can, you know, compromise on throughput if I have, you know, a, a restriction of a certain target uh, device. I can, you know, I can get an estimate of what will happen if I am limited to this particular device through the performance estimator that was uh, developed within this world. Right. So there are more details uh, available in the uh, publication called Tilenet, uh, as the title of this book, uh, of this presentation. There is also a standard cell implementation, which I did not go over, but then that resulted in higher throughputs. Of course, a standard cell implementation is very specific to a particular model. It, it, it is no longer programmable, but to get a feel of what is the performance, we also have some estimates in the paper. We have also looked at other devices and other estimates, estimations such as power and energy efficiency. All this was a joint effort uh, with a bunch of students, collaborators, and also institution. I am happy to take any questions or uh, that may be there uh, in this context. Do get in touch. Thank you.